Members, we continue on with order of the day, address and reply, and I give the call to the Honourable Simon O'Brien. In my first address to the House in 1997, I quoted this article of belief. Under the blessing of divine providence and given goodwill, mutual tolerance and understanding and energy and individual sense of purpose, there is no task that we cannot perform and no difficulty we cannot overcome. Later, when officiating at the opening of a major infrastructure project, in 2009, I introduced my remarks in this way. When I was very young and travelling in the family car through the South West, I was intrigued to learn that my father had been a member of the team that had built the substantial wooden bridge that we were just then crossing. I was enormously proud of having a dad who made such an impressive and enduring structure. There are a lot of Western Australians of all ages who can be mighty proud of their family connection to this project. 3,000 workers were involved in creating this magnificent addition to our road network, a total of some 3.8 million man hours. To create more than 140 kilometres of carriageway with six interchanges, 10 intersections, 19 bridges, they moved 12 million tonnes of sand, a million tonnes of crushed rock base and 27,000 cubic metres of concrete. The bridge here is just two separate structures, each 272 metres long. A prodigious physical and technical achievement completed months ahead of schedule. Most importantly of all, they did those 3.8 million hours using heavy equipment and hazardous materials without a lost time injury. To those 3,000 men and women, I say congratulations on a job well done. This will be an enduring symbol of your effort, and we're all very proud of you. Thank you for your efforts. The latest Quinana Freeway extension and the new Forest Highway is an investment in Western Australia's future. Of itself, this is the largest single road project in our history. It has transcended several state and federal governments, and I thank the many members and ministers, both state and federal, for the roles they've played in its concept, funding and construction. Occasions such as those demonstrate that my optimism is justified. And that's the message I want to leave with members for posterity. I have to approach this speech with a theme because I can't possibly refer to everything that's happened over the journey. To the hundreds of local government members and officers I've worked with, the many inquiries I've been part of, all the remarkable incidents and events. But I do want to recognise that it's not all about me. It's about the many people who've made it possible for me to achieve whatever has been achieved, who demonstrated by their commitment and support that by acting together and with the right motivation, we can do some amazing things. I reflected also in 1997 on the debt I owe to my parents Everett Bill O'Brien and my long-suffering but eternally loving mother, Dulcie O'Brien, knee shooter. He, the member for Murchison from 1952 to 1959, but more importantly, a fundamentally decent family man. She, a much respected nurse and carer, and I restate now my thanks to them for everything. People come to parliament with various aims, some want to legalise this or ban that. I was motivated to enter parliament because I wanted to be involved in public affairs, whatever the issues of the day, and pursue worthwhile outcomes. And I've been able to achieve more than I might have hoped. I joined the Liberal Party in August 1985 at the ripe old age of 25. I ran for a tough seat at the 1989 election. I did very well, never admitting I couldn't win. I did very well, coming second, informals came third. I became president of the Fremantle Division, applied myself to growing the party, learnt that one man's branch stacking is another man's membership drive, and I did all the other stuff you do when you're young and ambitious and keen in this game. And at this point, I want to acknowledge some of the many people who supported me all this time. 
some over 30 years and never let me down, including Stephen Knight and Hayden Shenton, together with apologies uh, to my oldest friend, Brad Hankinson, who's in theatre as we speak. I apologise to him for prevailing upon him to be the inaugural president of the Bibra Lake branch, a role we can safely say he needed like a hole in the head. Friends such as these, family members like Marilyn and Clive Knoll standing on a polling booth. She vivacious and no doubt vote attracting, him big and ugly and also vote attracting for another, another reason. People like my brother Bernard O'Brien, dressed up in his Liberal rosette finery with his hat on, hoping that his Labor schoolmates from Mount Magnet wouldn't happen by on that day, no doubt. Friends such as these, family members, sundry O'Briens, shooters, Mehmets and so many others. In 1993, I was number three on the South Metro ticket. We got 45 per cent of the, uh, the primary vote. The Greens got five per cent. We got two seats. The Greens got one. No complaints. That's the system. In a strangle-worthy example of stating the bleeding obvious, a kindly assistant returning officer gave me the, the nose-tapping advice the secret is to get higher up the ticket. <laughs> then in 1996, Madam President, with a surprise early election, I gained the number one spot on the ticket and was duly elected. That same electoral official came up beaming, shook me by the hand in congratulations and see, I told you that would do it. <laughs> now there have been many elections since uh, and in the 38th parliament, to chop and change around a bit, I was chair of a standing committee. Uh, a new Labor member arrived for our first meeting. Look, for the purpose of the exercise, I'll, I'll just refer to her as Samantha. And my colleague, my colleague noticed she looked a bit unsure and uncertain as she entered the room. And I said to him, "Don't worry, she'll be right. The Labor Party probably teach them the Liberals eat their young." And indeed, she was all right, and we had a great four years, uh, the five of us, with some very worthwhile inquiries, including a two-year inquiry into hydraulic fracturing, which produced a landmark report which passed muster with the EPA inquiry a few years later. We travelled to exotic locations like the Canning Basin, the far northwest of South Australia, Dongara. Hopefully our friend concluded we weren't too bad after all and don't eat our young. However, there is a TV show called Australian Survivor, which you might have seen. It can be a bit addictive if you start watching it. It has a motto, outwit, outplay, outlast. Members who are used to the political scene will understand. I sometimes have felt like I'm just in a very long running series of Survivor. Because when pre-selection came around in 2000 or thereabouts, some presumed to recognise my efforts by giving me the flick. My wife Joy came to the pre-selection meeting, which was an all-day affair, to show support and wait outside for the results. And during the meet and greet stage, Joy is greeting to another candidate's partner of, hi, how are you, was met with, we're very well. But for you, it'll be bye-bye. Charming. I'm sure Joy had a great day sweating on our future. I'm sure that after I held on by a slim margin, she enjoyed farewelling that same couple with a cheery, bye-bye. Came in here on the next Tuesday and Norman asked me how I went at pre-selection. I told him of the near run thing. And he said, oh yes, the first re-endorsement is a real danger point. Sorry, I should have warned you about that. The next pre-selection, or visit to tribal council, as I've come to know them, was really interesting with the late Doug Shave throwing his hat in the ring. Now, Doug was a serious player, and this matter attracted considerable attention. A number of the delegates were friends of us both, which prospectively made things very difficult for them. In the end, I scored the number one spot with a solid majority. He got number two by one vote. 
The bottom line is he was the best counter of numbers I have ever encountered, and he could also be, paradoxically, ruthlessly pragmatic. Outplay, outwit, outlast, as they say on Survivor. Now, let me tell you a bit more about the Liberal Party. The Liberal Party is a collection of like-minded people working in concert to get members elected and to get them elected in sufficient numbers to form governments. And together, we've shared great highs and morale-sapping lows. The show always goes on, though, and there will be more of these in the future, as the Honourable WN Stretch used to put it, all governments fall. Uh, Bill also used to observe that there are some people who are indispensable. As proof, we've got cemeteries full of them. But I digress. One thing I do know is that I wouldn't have arrived here or stayed here without the Liberal Party. It's thousands of volunteers, it's a handful of staff, it's many members, office bearers, state presidents, former state presidents, state directors, the Val Cloppers, the Joe Stantons, the Colette Wiltshires, the Sandra Browns, the Jim Maddens. To the Liberal Party and all its supporters over the years, I say a sincere and humble thank you. <clears throat> this appreciation extends even to those among you who taught me the hard way that sometimes the only person you can take at their word in politics is the one who looks you in the eye and says, I'm not voting for you. Yes, even to those who tried to take me down by various means, I extend a backhanded thank you as well. Those experiences helped toughen me up for a tough game and avoid, in due course, being eaten up and spat out. So I arrived in this place. On day one, I was elected to the Estimates Committee. So when we knocked off, I said, well, what happens tomorrow? And they said, oh, it's Estimates Week. So straight away, I found myself uh, on the second day in Estimates hearings, even sharing sessions, which is a great introduction to the structure and functions of state government and the, the personalities and the major agencies and their budgets and all, and all of that. There were maiden speeches. Now, some members over the years have declared at the outset that the Legislative Council should be done away with. Those same members, in my experience, and I've seen a fair few of them, declare in their final speech that they've changed their view with the benefit of experience. I commend those members for their frankness. That should be the answer to any armchair expert who persists in the view that a unicameral system holds a superior option for legislative integrity. You know, I feel sorry for people who come in here thinking they know it all. Because if you think you know everything, you're ultimately destined to learn nothing. And in my political career, it's been a great privilege and delight to explore so many parts of our wider community. You know, people want to show their member of parliament their project, their school, their business, their factory, to open up about their aspirations, share their concerns. I certainly worked hard to get to know my region and its people. I mean, all members are busy, work long hours, get roped in to serve on management committees and so on. I soon learnt that most people went to their assembly member for assistance first, then they come to an MLC, sort of as a member of last resort, because they weren't happy, perhaps, with the response they'd received. Funny thing is, I always found that about 90 per cent of the problems that did come to me, and generally mind they're, they're late in the piece, you know, their final notices, court summonses because you didn't pay the fine, that thing. I found that most of them, 90 per cent, you could fix them with a phone call or an article of advice. Surprising. But I also found satisfaction in sorting things out that others had given up on. Uh, and again, they tended to be difficult or protracted problems, but so much the better if I could make it happen through my own efforts. You know, there's a, there's a place down at Armandbury Road in Applecross between the high school and, the garden, and Garden City. And they all told me, oh, it can't be done, we've all tried, don't waste your time. Well, that crosswalk's been there for 20 years now. The sound walls you'll see completed uh, by the uh, freeway off-ramps at South Lake. When they were the new freeway off-ramps, they weren't completed because of noise contours and stuff like that. I got onto Rob Harvey, who I knew through the Melbourne Safer Roads Committee as a colleague, 
He was then acting as head of Main Roads. I said, Rob, I don't care about your noise contour measuring. My housewives in South Lake are getting your dirt blown onto their washing. Rob's a decent man and a married man. Go down the freeway now and you'll see those completed sound walls. I was once told when a working group I was on, look, we know it's a tragedy the student was killed, but the thing is we do not put 40k signs up on 70 kilometre an hour roads and we don't put fences up down the median and we do not paint the traffic limit, speed limit on the road. If you go to Murdoch Drive now, you can see all of those there and elsewhere. For Kidlink, I had a lot to do with in Quinana. For years, they didn't have the wherewithal to move into the uh, surplus homes, old Holmes West House that my predecessor had arranged for them years before. So my office had to step in and arrange the refurbishment through a number of private contractors that were involved in the Quinana refurbishment at the time, through council, utilities providers, and David Lloyd at my office, uh, I remember uh, being particularly effective, though he's no longer with us now. I was made an honorary member of the Totally and Partially Disabled Veterans of Western Australia because I worked with the organisation to obtain land for a peaceful bushland site for permanent and respite accommodation. I uh, also managed to get them an ex-PTA bus, which they put to good use, and then we secured uh, funding to build dwellings, now long occupied by veterans in need of such accommodation. So, yes, there's many things we can all achieve as private members, assisting community groups, assisting individuals, but we don't do it without owing a great deal to electorate office staff, who, as our colleague Colin Holt just observed, the Honourable Colin Holt just observed, actually run the place. My current team of Danielle Rudolph, Larissa Forbes, Natalie Struther and Miley Barclay, who have been with me probably between them for about 30 years, uh, more than wonderful. And the end of my parliament term is also a challenge for them as they contemplate the next chapter of their respective lives. I also want to acknowledge Kelly Terry, Renee Dunstan, Chelsea Kirith, Nicole Kabuga, and every other casual relief volunteer or work experience helper who has contributed to the life of my office. Now, Norman Moore often told us that you really need to be a minister to get things done. Well, that's easier said than done, uh, as, as we all know. Uh, I did a, 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 an apprenticeship for many years, uh, you know, establishing good working relationships in a variety of sectors, doing the hard yards of travelling the state to go out and sit on the oil drum, as Howard Croxton used to say, uh, getting up at five to ring around the media outlets to see if they, you know, they'd let you have a grab. Uh, on whatever the issue of the day was. I came into the disabilities portfolio with little past experience. I was in the DDC's politician adoption scheme, uh, having been adopted by Tony Catlow and her, president, her parents, Chris and Helga, but I was really starting from scratch. Over several years, I got to know the sector. Hayden Lowe provided great support. John Knowles also did, and a host of others. We launched a major project. Uh, myself and Colin Barnett at the time, signalling disability is a major priority. And after the uh, 2005 election, quite a few people in the sector privately expressed their disappointment that I hadn't got in to deliver the outcomes that we'd identified, which was some comfort, not much. But I had a number of shadow portfolios which kept changing with a merry-go-round of opposition leaders from 05 to 08. The amount of money I wasted on redundant business cards. As we Predominant among these was transport. I launched a policy about the future of Fremantle port container operations, and Labor attacked me with enthusiasm, and the Libs loved it. Now, now the Labor government's all for moving container operations to the sand, while the Libs are dead set against it. It surprises me, Madam President, that no one in all this has thought to come and ask me what my thought processes were behind my proposal in 2006. When I first brought the idea into a public debate, I'd tell them for nothing and it might help. Still, perhaps some people reckon they know it all. In late September 2008, we found ourselves in government after a remarkable string of occurrences. I was sworn in as Minister for Transport and, to my surprise and delight, Disability Services. 
About a week later, I suffered, started suffering severe pains in my back for about three days continuously. I cut to the chase. I'd been having a series of heart attacks. And I owe my life to the expert care of cardiologist Dr Zian Fang Zhu. And after six days in the ICU at St John of God Murdoch, I was able to go home on a very strict regimen of rest and recovery, which does not go well with initial ministerial duties. At a subsequent consultation I had with Dr Zhu, as she was whacking on the, uh, the blood pressure cuff, she said, oh, by the way, my mum said to tell you, thanks very much for bringing in the free off-peak travel for seniors. Now, Zian Fang and her husband Bruce are now valued friends. My wife also was amazing in providing the care and diet I required. I, I really didn't know how ill I'd been. It was a difficult time because there was a great deal to be done. Uh, and I, I was initially unable to walk to the end of the street, um, let alone assume ministerial, ministerial responsibilities. It took a long time eventually to clear the backlog. But in all the things I've mentioned, there's one constant companion, one full capacity partner, my wife of 41 years, Joy. Now, she's organised polling booths, indeed whole election campaigns in difficult seats. Of course, we upper house members are condemned to look after all the difficult seats. And we've got plenty now. Sometimes, dare I say it, with difficult candidates that come and go. She organised fundraisers of all sorts, quiz nights, dinners, fashion parades. She even had Brendan Nelson walk her down the catwalk at one, one of them when he was federal leader. She's crocheted so many blankets, donated to worthy causes or raffled to raise money. She's been a branch president and suffered through more AGMs and conferences, Madam President, than any human being should have to suffer in a lifetime. With Lee Moore, Mrs Lee Moore, she helped organise functions for members' spouses, uh, not only for social purposes but as a form of pastoral care for members of the wider team who might otherwise feel isolated by the harsh realities of political life. In due course, Joy took over the role Lee had established, assisted by the very capable Margaret Buswell. More importantly to me, she's been the one person I could rely on in all circumstances. The one to help me be strong when I might flag, to endure when I might have thrown in the towel. And there have been occasions. She provided the inspiration to dig deep when extra effort was needed to prevail. Now, many of you have noted my wide and eclectic collection of ties. <coughs> and you've scoffed, some of you, go on, admit it, when I told you my wife is the one who selects my tie every day. And over the years, many people have noticed us at a function as a couple and said, gee, you guys go well together. And doesn't Joy always look immaculate? <clears throat> now, there's no accident here. It's just that Joy is the only person who could possibly enable me to be simultaneously a Minister of the Crown and a matching handbag. <laughs> now, Joy and I are looking forward to new challenges and new chapters. Now, at this point, Don Ray, you've got those tissues, Andy. Together with our daughter Nadika and extended family, grandchildren uh, Rita, Haley, Tanya, Jacob, and Jasmine, seven great grandchildren, we've got a whole new purpose. It's great to have someone calling me dad. I've so much to be grateful for. And I'm quite happy to declare it to the whole world that if it were not for joy, my life would be crushingly incomplete. Thank you. Back, however, to the ministerial office, Madam President. One of my first priorities was to re-establish the Department of Transport and that involved separating the transport areas of DPI and uniting them with Main Roads WA and the PTA. 
I'll never forget the look of gratitude on the face of Eric Lumsden as he was relieved of all the transport stuff, the licensing, the school buses, the taxis, the regional air routes, ramps and jetties and all the rest so that he could concentrate on his beloved planning. The new Department of Transport works and works well, uh, as does its various constituent parts. Visiting Carnarvon at the time of the new uh, department coming into effect, I was surprised to be warmly greeted by the DOT officers there down on the uh, waterfront of that office. Um, they were already wearing black jerseys with the new logo and the new Department of Transport uh, name on the breast. And it turned out they weren't issue. They were so pleased to be Department of Transport, they'd gone off and arranged them to be made themselves. The new head of uh, transport we appointed was Rhys Waldock, who'd be known to most of you, I imagine, and he delighted in playing Humphrey Appleby to my Jim Hacker. And I embarked on a great learning curve, me doing the learning, him doing the curving. And um, he had a wonderful thing, and there's one or two other people in this uh, chamber he's worked for, and they'll probably recognise this. You'd come up with a bright idea and say, why don't we do this? And he'd say, well, Minister, you could do that. But what would happen? And then he'd recite a litany of potential disasters about how the world would end and everyone would hate it and you'll be attacked left, right and centre, and then conclude with the phrase, but, Minister, it's your call. <laughs> so you'd then go, right, next item on the agenda. And if you looked particularly disappointed, he'd say, don't worry, Minister, it's my job to make you look good. A challenge worthy of his talents uh, in some parts, I suppose. When I left that portfolio at the end of 2010, I was provided a typed list of achievements. I've got it here. It runs to about, typed to about four pages, um, which I look back with great affection. But uh, some of it's what I'd call business as usual matters, such as funding rounds for um, regional boating facilities, regional airport development. But most of it, though, I'm pleased to say, is for standalone projects and ones where I either had to fight to get the funding or fight to stop Blimmin Buswell in Treasury, when he was there, from taking it away. One of the major decisions I had to take uh, to Cabinet was for the deepening of Fremantle Harbour and associated works which fundamentally rebuilt the North Wharf area and through land reclamation it greatly increased, I'd say at least doubled, the, uh, the port's land estate. Now some might see that as variance uh, with my previously mentioned views on the future of container operations, but I can assure you all uh, that it was not without consideration uh, that uh, the uh, cost of $360 million be ameliorated. And the fact is that land will be able to be used for container operations for many decades if, uh, and if the land side transport links can be established in some sort of suitable form indefinitely. Conversely, uh, they will greatly increase the value of the location and funding the development of other facilities elsewhere if that's ultimately the chosen course. Um, another multi notable success I want to touch on is the uh, construction of the Utah Point multi-user facility at Port Hedland, um, which, I, which had stalled when I arrived. No blaming anybody. It was a, a partnership which um, uh, hadn't been able to achieve what it needed to achieve. I was able to resurrect it, get the required government input, and particularly by way of funding, about 80 mil, I think it was, uh, and we were able to open, uh, complete the building and open that facility. And I'm proud of both of those projects. I can't think of too many transport ministers uh, who have built substantial new port facilities, such as at Fremantle and at... and at... Um, uh, I said too many, too many. Uh, the Mandurah Entrance Road project was brought forward by a year and, more importantly, expanded to be a major four-lane road, complete with rail tunnels to make future needs. Uh, we initiated and completed the second stage of the Lancelin Cervantes Road, 
providing 55 k's of new sealed coast road from Ocean Farms Estate up to Pinnacles Drive. Um, that was widely welcomed by tourists and locals alike who had been calling for it for years, and it took a great deal of pressure off the Brand Highway by separating much of the tourist traffic, which still remains problematic, but separating it from the heavy traffic on the uh, Brand Highway, which, with which it had been in conflict, of course, for many years. My uh, brother, uh, Mitch O'Brien, who for many years has had the biggest panel beaters in the Midwest at Mora, I apologise to him. Um, for any reduction in uh, business that might come his tongue in cheek, of course, any reduction in business that might come his way uh, because of the, uh, the conflict being taken off the brand highway. But he looked at me conspiratorially and he said, Simon, he says, uh, many of you probably know Mitch, and he said, uh, he said, you've got very clever engineers at Main Roads. But they can't engineer out the kangaroos. <laughs> and the business is still running very well indeed. Um, I thought that one of our biggest successes was the contribution of, the, uh, of my department, and in particular the PTA, to getting, securing, uh, to getting that federal funding that was necessary uh, to commence the Perth City Link project, which was failing until it was identified. Um, basically by me at a late night meeting at Perth Airport with Colin Barnett and then Prime Minister Rudd, that what they actually wanted was a public transport project, not a planning project. So we rejigged our rejigged it, you know, sinking the bus station, sinking the railway and all of that. The next thing you know, I was out there announcing it with uh, Minister Albanese just down the road here. That was a major uh, coup at the time. Now, look, there's many other roads and bridges constructed at the time, much of it made possible by a, a more favourable tendering environment that fortuitously arrived, and so that was uh, luck as well. And, you know, we introduced air conditioning to school buses in the regions, and I've already mentioned the uh, free off peak travel of seniors and people with disability. Uh, also initiated the Butler Rail extension, took it through Cabinet, took it through EERC, enabling legislation through Parliament, awarded contracts, started construction, didn't get to finish it, because that's what happens when you move on. There's always projects underway. But it's not very often that a new ferry comes to, into service uh, down at South Perth. Uh, and they're good, because they're the parts of the public transport system that almost pay their own way. And it was a happy occasion when Maxine Pendle, Joy and the similarly irrepressible Shelley Taylor-Smith got together to launch a new South Perth ferry, the MV Philip Pendle, about the anniversary of his, uh, uh, of his passing. You remember Rhys Waldock I mentioned a minute ago? My job, Minister, is to make you look good. He showed me the two big bottles of bubbly, you know, with ribbons around them and all of that, so that I was able to tell the ladies officiating, you tip the cheap one over the boat to launch it, and the official toasts, you use the good one for the official toasts. Thanks very much, Rhys. Now, in late 2010, there was a ministerial reshuffle of Cabinet, and having been the first Liberal Transport Minister since Cyril Rushton, I now became the first Finance Minister since Max Evans. And uh, we set up a new portfolio in another department I created, the new uh, within the portfolio of Finance, Commerce and Small Business. And uh, with the Department of Finance formally commenced in July 2011, uh, we had the redoubtable Anne Nolan in as uh, Director General with some other very good uh, people on board. Now, there's a, the, the portfolio is responsible for a whole range of, uh, of industry boards and, and so on, as well as the principal offices of state revenue, uh, building management and works, shared services. I promptly took to Cabinet a proposal to wind up the Office of Shared Services, which, in my view, was a failing experiment that had cost hundreds of millions, was about to cost hundreds of millions more, and just about everyone was fed up with it. So that move was well received 
uh, just about, by just about everyone in the public sector and beyond. Uh, it was lurching on and needed someone to bite the bullet and say enough, so we did. Uh, first thing I did uh, after the decision um, was to go to Cannington to speak to all the staff and reassure them that they'd have options to return to their parent agencies, uh, to be redeployed elsewhere, to receive redundancy, a redundancy, their choice. Ultimately, I think most were satisfied with the arrangement. It was not easy, as you can imagine. That was not easy, but I think I earned my pay that week. Curiously, no one's ever asked me how a shared services operation, which is pretty good in theory, could work. And if anyone wanted to ask on either side, I just might tell them. Just saying. I was pleased to work with another building agency, and uh, building management and works was a, a great success story. Still is, I think. The works program that we'd inherited in late 2008 was beset by cost overruns. And I don't want to make this a political thing, uh, Madam President, but um, there were all sorts of difficulties that were systemically embedded, as well as an unfortunate economic environment at the time. The average by which government projects worth over $10 million at the time, there were 70, uh, 58 of them at the time, I think, on average they were 92 per cent over budget. Now, I didn't bring on the works reform package but I did consolidate it with BMW, with a thing they called strategic asset management, to make sure that these projects were actually funded and planned right in the first place. So you didn't have people wanting to put car parks under the Perth arena and then take them out and then put them back again, or put extra floors on hospitals when they were almost finished constructed, and all those things which are a very poor practice uh, indeed. I used to take a spreadsheet of all of our larger projects to Cabinet every now and then. There'd be about 60 or so on them at any one time. And the spreadsheet listed all the projects in progress, maybe 60, uh, as I say, at any point, with a green, amber or red light bond to show whether they were at risk of cost overrun or time overrun. And I was very glad to see that the predominant colour was green, green, green. And that's a, uh, a tribute to, uh, in particular, to the, uh, the people in that agency. In commerce, there was a great deal to be done, and working with the team headed by Brian Bradley and Anne Driscoll, who many of you would know, was a great pleasure indeed. We did all sorts of um, things that were outstanding. I think we were charged with a sense of purpose. I don't know why so many things had been languishing, but most of this legislation here, which I took through this place, most of it is from commerce, and we did a great deal in the areas of sorting out problems in commercial tenancy, in retail tenancy. One of these large volumes here is a rewritten Workers' Compensation Injury Management Act. Um, I remember uh, Greg Joyce, the chairman, and Michelle Reynolds, the then CEO of uh, work cover were so happy with that outcome that went through the parliament, and I acknowledged the then opposition for their assistance, uh, that they arrived at my office at the next meeting with one of these enormous boxes. I've never seen one like it, a box of Whitman sampler that was about arm's length long. For months afterwards, my ministerial staff were saying, hey, does work cover need any more legislation going? Look, we did all sorts of things. I mean, and I won't try and go through it all, uh, Madam uh, President, but uh, there were some things that are worth noting. Um, brought in Sunday and public holiday trading and the world didn't collapse, but most people found that after Saturday, Sunday was now their most popular day for shopping. I even brought in a workers' compensation system for the first time for jockeys. And uh, they had their national president and everyone out here on the, the front steps with me. I was really hoping we'd have some pictures because it was a, it's not often that I'm in a gathering and I'm the tallest person in the picture. And uh, that the national president of the Jockeys Association said, Minister, we really appreciate what you've done. That's what, that's what counts. If this was a bad story about you know, cheating at the races or something, the media would be here in their droves, but this is good news. So we're happy. Let's leave it at that. And we did. 
I appointed the state's first small business commissioner, along with, the, uh, uh, with his alternative dispute resolution service, which doesn't sound that sexy at first glance, but what it was about was providing a free or low-cost alternative to resolve disputes without people having to get blimmin' lawyers involved and courts and what have you, and it taking forever. And it has been a great success, and it continues under uh, the commissionership of David Eaton, who I appointed to this day. And I also want to acknowledge Jackie Finlayson, with whom I work closely at SBDC. Now, it was in disabilities that I want to conclude my discussion of ministerial jobs, and we were able to greatly increase resources in a range of areas, uh, something carried forward by the Hon. Donna Farragher as a subsequent minister as well, but I'll mention just one, the Alternatives to Employment program. And you think, oh, beauty. Well, the Alternatives to Employment program is so important. You see, previously, families with a child with very high care needs would receive perhaps two hours per week of respite assistance after that child had left school, because, of course, while full-time schooling, in effect, provided about 40 weeks a year of respite. We increased that entitlement from about two hours a week, on average, to four days a week. You see, Madam President, there's I want to give a shout out to the people in disabilities. About one in six of us have a disability. Look at the numbers in this room. And of those, about one in six of those need some assistance in their daily lives. And of course then there's another smaller cohort which requires very high levels of care and assistance indeed. But of all of the care that is provided through various mechanisms, a lot of it by government, but 73 per cent of that care that people need is provided by family and friends. If it wasn't for that spirit of caring that exists across all divides in our community, the system of, our system would collapse and a lot of people would be in a parlous state. And several years later, I've told this story before, but I want to tell it again. I was visiting a senior camp at some years afterwards and over morning tea in the staff room, I was approached by a lady who said, I hope you don't mind, I just wanted to say thank you very much for the program you brought in when you were Minister for Disabilities. We have a grown child with high care needs and we know many other families in the same boat. Thanks to you, our family, unlike others we've seen in the past, has stayed together. I've been able to keep working, which has saved my sanity and brought in some money. Unlike others, we haven't had to commit our child to care or suffer divorce or even suicide in the family, and we're doing okay, and I just wanted you to know how much it is appreciated. Madam President, members, I think that is why we are in this game, to achieve those sorts of outcomes. And I'd like to thank my ministerial staff over the years. My chief of staff all along was H.M. Curry. He was that big shaven-haired bruiser that apparently the member for Armadale at the time took exception to as an advisor in estimates, I believe. Happy memories. To Brett Barton, Tony Papaphilis, Keitha Wilkinson, Steve Eady, Nicole Kabugwa, Dean Roberts, uh, Alan O'Brien, Ursula Chexfield, Lom Piggott, Susan McCall, Ginny Yankovsky, Yvette Roper, Han Tran, May Stamaria, to Phil Payne, to Peter Groves, James Campbell Everton, Charles Hayne, Ashley Clark, Stella. Stella knows I could never pronounce her name, but it'll be enhanced as Grigrinovic. 
Yvette Roper, Jessica Humphrey, and Rebecca Hawkins. Now, Rebecca Hawkins was my personal assistant, one of my personal assistants who look up, used to look after my diary, and gee, she was good. She was the apple of Mrs Minister's eye, Mrs Minister they used to call her, because she'd look after the diary so well and make sure arrangements were made. But I will never forget, again, like the Jockeys Association, Beck, bless her, was about yay high. And occasionally, after all of those years of doing it all for yourself in opposition, if someone needed an appointment, typically not a ministerial appointment but an uh, electorate issue, I'd say, oh, yeah, well, look, I, I can, why don't you come up on Friday at whatever, and I'd just put it in the, you know, the computed calendar thing. Next thing you know, Rebecca would be there looking up at me, lips pursed, hands on hips like this, and go, now, Minister, you know you're not meant to do that, don't you? And then she'd go on and say, in due course, I've spoken to you th about this before, haven't I? <laughs> and meanwhile, the Chief of Staff, the big shaven head bruiser and anyone else is nearby, we're all shuffling their feet and I'm going, yes, yeah, sorry, Beck, I won't do it again. Bless her. <coughs> Madam President, um, I'm hoping to conclude my remarks shortly so that I can earn the gratitude of members by a decision for you to leave the chair early for afternoon tea. And <laughs> with that point of in, in, in possible in, ingratiation, I'll just note that I've been a member for 24 years. I guess that amounts to around 500 sitting weeks. It's a lot of standing committees committee inquiries. I know I've attended over 200 cabinet meetings, each of which was a substantial exercise. Here's where I do the old codger bit. I never had a mobile phone or an email until I came into parliament. There were 34 members then, 36 now. It surprises me how few names we've all had between us. When I arrived, we had the three Murrays in 1997 the Liberal Murray, Nick, Honourable Murray Nixon, who I acknowledge in your gallery, Madam President, and the National Murrays, Criddle and Montgomery. Recently, of course, we've got three Collins, two of them are Nats, and there, indeed there's some in my crowd who think possibly on occasion one might even be a bit much. <laughs> we used to have a couple of Toms. Tom Helm, who used to make me and everybody else laugh, and Tom Stevens, who I quite liked, even though he was mad as a cut snake. <laughs> God bless you, Tom, if you're reading this. Um, but it gets worse, Madam President. Now we've got two Alanas. Obviously, I mean, by any measure, we are exceedingly blessed. <laughs> Now, Bill Stretch, I mentioned before, he was one of the great characters I met in this place as a colleague, and I just want to recall briefly the benefits I received over the years through the example and the experience and friendship of members like the Honourable George, Honourable George Cash, Norman Moore. I mean, these are my mentors. Um, Peter Foss, the inimitable Derek Tomlinson, the lovely Muriel Patterson, Bruce Donaldson, Robin McSweeney, with whom I shared an office, that ministerial office, and then our on the way out office for eight years, and many others. I also acknowledge the late Kim Chance, uh, the ons Nick Griffiths, John Cowdell, Lily Ravlich, Murray Criddle, Ken Travers, as members who featured on so many occasions in my parliamentary experience. There have been 107 members of the Legislative Council during my time here, or 109 if you count a couple that have been and gone. Twice. So I hope you will all understand that I can't mention them all, but I do say to each of them, thank you for sharing and adding to my life experience as a member of the Parliament of Western Australia. To all members, I would say, we've had many shared experiences. I will miss you. And of course, I wish you well in every phase of your lives.
to my Liberal colleagues. I'm not going to go round and give an individual greeting on the floor of the House. Judge not lest ye be judged. But to those of you that will be going on, if you continue to perform as well as you have during all the time I've been here, the future of the Liberal Party and the Parliament is in good hands. And uh, I wish you all the best. To others, I will only single out the leader of the opposition, our new leader of the opposition, and congratulations to him on acceding to that role at the tender age of 53. All you need to know for now is that he is a short-tempered veterinary surgeon. So some of you blokes over there, don't be too smart, Alecky. That's my advice. Take it or leave it. Some general reflections, Madam President, as I bow out. One of the things that media and other reporters in particular want to see is they want to see people that they can write about that have in their terms set the world alight. I've always preferred to see a minister's role as stopping bushfires in the first place. Anticipating problems, making sure they either don't occur or that your measures are in place to deal with them. And I think that is the measure uh, by which uh, all ministers should ultimately be judged. I also point out, and some don't agree with me on this, but I reckon, I firmly believe in fact, that it's a minister's duty to be a buffer between the bureaucracy and the people they represent and not an apologist. Now in politics, we hear so much about getting tough on this or cracking down on that. When I reflect on my time in parliament and in government, I'm very pleased that my contribution has not been centred about that. It's been about making it easier for people to go about their lives and their businesses. And I am very satisfied about being able to look back on my time here uh, in that spirit. I want to thank, in the parliament, before I go, some people that have long-suffering people. The Clark's party, the chamber staff, there have been many over the years, uh, but to uh, all of them, the, uh, together with the committee office staff and indeed all the staff of the wider parliament, particularly in the dining room, and the paymaster, I've got one more transaction with him, but to all of them I say thank you for your service, but more pointedly, thank you for helping me to go about my role in a professional and tolerant environment. To you, Madam President, I say it's been a privilege to know and work with you these 20 years now, and an interesting time we've had over the last four years working ever closer together. Now, there's all sorts of issues of the day that come along, but I will say this. I know that, you've, that there are challenges in the role of President, unique challenges and that sometimes you cannot acquaint freely members at large or your party room with facts related to your job in a way that others may pretend they can. I don't know if you're able to share or if those members at large know about some of the stresses and strains that you have been exposed to and how you have dealt with them. But I will tell members that the Deputy President does know. And as in that capacity, I say to you that you have performed and continue to perform your role with distinction. May I go on further? to say 
that it has been my very long experience in public life that those who are prepared to stand up to the duties of their office and perform them, when others might presume to suggest that their duty lies elsewhere, those that resist that sort of pressure and show integrity and strength thereby, those are the people who grow in stature, respect and understanding. And you, Madam, deserve all of those accolades. And it's a great privilege to serve with you, and I wish you well in the future. Amen. To all members, I recognise that it's a hard game we're in. You don't go through it, as Norman used to say, without acquiring some scars along the way. And if you haven't got any scars, then you probably weren't a player. But I will acknowledge, having done as one does in farewell speeches and spoken about all the good stuff, I'll acknowledge the tough road that you've all got ahead. And it can be tough when you've got all sorts of pressures from your party room or the media or constituents or whatever pressures are, with people that presume to tell you what your duty and responsibility is, but you know in your heart of hearts that it lies somewhere else, and what are you going to do about it? I wish you all the best in being able to deal with those challenges that you will confront in the future. And in offering my house, uh, this house, it's not mine anymore, in offering the house my most genuine best wishes for the future, to each and every one of you I conclude where I began. Under the blessing of divine providence and given goodwill, mutual tolerance and understanding and energy and individual sense of purpose, there is no task that we cannot perform and no difficulty that we cannot overcome. Thank you.